Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Crypto Marketing Insights. Um, let me talk to you real quick about the thing that shall not be named. Um, and the whole face mask thing, right? Why am I talking about this on a Marketing Insights channel? Well, it has a lot to do with marketing. Um, when you market a pandemic as a pharmaceutical company with a vaccine or a company that markets masks or a company that markets other protective gear, gloves, aprons, robes, shields, whatever you use, um, inherently there are financial interests on the part of the company producing the products to move them to the industry that's buying them and consuming them. And the greater you have consumption, the greater you need to supply, therefore, the higher the price goes up, supply, demand, right? Well, um, again, I'm not anti anything, I'm not whatever, I like science, <laughs> I like the facts, I like the data, um, and I'm looking at how the global response from a marketing perspective has to do with the facts. So when we look at the facts of the macro trends, we see that effectively, if you look at 1950 to, uh, to you know 2100, according to UN projections, but if you look at the factual data from 1950 to today, uh, you actually see that the global rate of death, the death rate, if you will, the annual death rate globally per year since 1950 had been um, effectively decreasing, okay, between zero and uh, to one or even two percent a year, two and a quarter percent. There was even in the sixties, it was dropping by more than three and a third percent, almost three and three and a half, almost four percent, three point seven percent. Right. So I'll, I'll link all the data for you to look at yourself. It's right there on the macro trend site. We'll also look at the, the CDC website real quick. Um, but in general, what is interesting is that in twenty twenty, the uh, death rate is. 0.44% higher in terms of growth rate compared to 2019, which was the exact same growth rate compared to 2018. And before that, we had negative growth rates for 60 years, basically, from 1950 to 2018. Okay. Now, ask yourself, why would we suddenly start seeing an increase in death rate if COVID didn't happen? Did I say that word? If that thing didn't happen... Um, until late 2019, obviously not millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people died from it immediately at the end of 2019, right? It was thousands of people maybe, but not so much as to affect the growth rate from minus 0.3% to positive 0.4%, which was like, you know, a significant change. Um, however, also have to remember that people from the silent generation uh, are passing away. And even people from the baby boomer generation are passing away. And the baby boomer generation was a significant explosion in population. So obviously when they start to pass away, we are going to have a significant explosion in the death rate, right? Because they are going to die in similar fashion as they were born throughout a generation, right? Roughly, that's just the way life goes, right? So if you actually look at the overall death rate, um, it is not outside of the norms globally. And this is just from the world data from the United Nations World Population Prospects. Again, linked to the data right there. Uh, if we look at other data, right there on the CDC website, right, like the Center for Disease Control of the United States, considered an authoritative website, it's considered the authoritative institution, right, that's, that's where the experts turn to when they say, look at the CDC, right, so cdc.gov has their latest mortality surveillance index, showing some very interesting numbers. Now, what's interesting is that they have combined on this uh, graph, on this latest surveillance, they have combined, maybe conveniently, maybe not, but pneumonia, influenza, and COVID. So on the chart they're showing you, they're showing you a combination, which is 
fine. Everyone manipulates data. This is the way they're doing it. They're showing you the combination spike. Um, and there is a spike, but if you look at the actual causes of death on the same article, what's very interesting is that you notice in COVID uh, reported deaths, um, basically 46%, almost, yeah, 46, more than 46% of people who have been hospitalized with and tagged with COVID, 46% did not have other conditions if they were children. But the other 54% of the children did. And guess how many adults had no other conditions? According to the CDC, and we'll get to their numbers, other numbers in a second, but according to the CDC, 8.8% .8 of adults had no other conditions. Meaning the other 91.2% had pre-existing conditions. And what um, what kind of pre-existing condition? Asthma, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, gastrointestinal liver disease, uh, hypertension, immune suppression, metabolic disease, neurological disease, obesity, pregnancy, renal disease, and other disease. Right? So basically everyone who has been tagged in hospitalization uh, for COVID in the United States, according to the CDC, uh, has another disease or pre-existing condition. And you're asking yourself, well, why do children have such a high incidence of kids getting COVID with no previous condition? Because they're kids. They don't have previous conditions yet. They're too young. So the ones who get it, half of them have a pre-existing condition, and slightly less than half of them don't, right? So that makes sense because, again, the kids, and if you look again at the statistics that the CDC provides right here, it shows you very clearly on the same inc infographic that most of the kids who are getting, you know, getting COVID, actually, who have pre-existing conditions, their pre-existing conditions are pretty much the same bad ones that adults who get it get it from. Obesity, asthma, um, and uh, immune suppression and neurological diseases. Right? So kids have a little bit of a different response to other things too, like whatever, but you know, kid, you know, adults have more hypertension because kids don't usually have hypertension, right? They're kids. We want to not have them have that. So my point is in the data from the CDC, it makes it very clear in their latest infographic, um, basically the people that need to be protected from this are the people who have those conditions that I listed because they're the most likely people to catch anything. And again, um, people who have no pre-existing conditions are not likely to catch this thing. Right, not if they're adults, right? Less than 10% of adults had any, uh, had no pre-existing conditions, right? And less than half the kids um, had no pre-existing conditions. So, again, I'm not, and you know, if you are somebody whose health is at risk, obviously, like the doctors say, you should protect your health and everything else. That makes perfect sense. But if you're not at risk, it actually doesn't help for you to wear a mask um, unless you're going to come into contact with people who are at risk, in which case, of course, you should wear a mask. Um, but the reason again, this isn't about a politics of wearing a mask or not. You do what is right, right? You wear a mask to protect those who are possibly going to get sick. And other than that, if you're outside in the air, frankly, wearing a mask is not healthy if you are a healthy person. It is a bad thing to keep a layer of cloth in front of your face and keep all the germs in and all that stuff, right? Or, you know, spread them on yourself rather than let them blow in the air. And that's the other thing. If you're wearing a mask and you're outside, the things you are breathing out of your mask, yes, they stuck to your mask and everything else, and they won't go on you, but some of it will still blow in the air. And everybody's outside, right? So it's still blowing in the air. So to try to think that it's not going to blow in the air just because you're wearing a mask is really naive. I mean, it's just naive. Look at the, the studies of the heat maps that they show in the infrared. You can see the stuff is still getting away from the person. And that's in a controlled experiment indoors under lab conditions with perfect lighting and cameras and everything else. Put them outside in the open air. 
breathing freely or not, you know, mask or not, the air is still traveling, right? You're not stopping the air from moving, right? So it, it, I'm just pointing out the marketing interest of the people who sell the masks for $5, $10, $15, $20, $20 whatever their prices are, is quite telling. Um, I know I have a lot more to add to this, but I'm going to keep this one short for now. Maybe I'll add more before I post this, but I'm not sure. For now, thanks again for watching Crypto Marketing Insights. Oh, yeah, how is this related to crypto, by the way? Well, I'll tell you. Um, I think I'll save it for another time. But it is related to crypto, and it is related to marketing. Think about it, follow the money. That's where it all comes down to. So until next time, folks, take care. I just want to be clear in terms of the definition of people dying of COVID. So the case definition is, is very simplistic. It means at the time of death, um, it, it was a COVID positive diagnosis. So that means that if you were in hospice and had already been given you know, a few weeks to live, and then you also were found to have COVID, that would be counted as a COVID death. It means that if, um, it, technically, if even if you died of, of clear alternate cause, but you had COVID at the same time, it's still listed as a COVID death. So um, everyone who's listed as a COVID death doesn't mean that that was the cause of the death, but they had COVID at the time of death. I hope that's helpful. If someone with COVID-19 is hospitalized and passes away, does the government reimburse hospitals more for that type of care? News 8's Shannon Handy looked into the issue and has details in this Verify report. Hospitals do get reimbursed when caring for patients on Medicare, including those with COVID-19. Medicare is a government-funded insurance program for those 65 and older. The question is, how much are hospitals getting and are they inflating the numbers? We can verify hospitals do get paid more for COVID-19 related cases. A provision in the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security or CARES Act pays an additional 20% on top of traditional Medicare rates during the public health emergency. How much are hospitals getting? The numbers vary. During a television interview, a Minnesota state senator said it was $13,000 for someone admitted with COVID-19 and $39,000 if they were placed on a ventilator. But those estimates have not been verified. According to a Medicare spokesperson, while hospitals do get reimbursed more for patients on ventilators, quote, Medicare adjusts hospital payment based on geographic variation in local costs. possible there's no proof of it happening that same medicare spokesperson told us claims with inaccurate diagnosis or drg would be subject to recoupment and or other potential civil or criminal charges for false claims to date we couldn't find any hospital cited for making inaccurate claims on discharge papers or death certificates hospital coronavirus cash flow you've sent us a lot of emails concerned that hospitals are forging covid 19 on discharge papers for a bigger payout News aides Heather Walker is following the money. When a Medicare patient goes to the hospital, Medicare pays the hospital according to the set payment rates. But starting April 15th of this year, the CARES Act increased payments for cases involving a person diagnosed with COVID-19 by 20%. All local hospitals we reached out to denied our request for interviews about the payments. Metro Health Hospital responded over email, confirming that they are being paid more for COVID-19 treatments, adding that most commercial plans were following suit with a 20% uplift in payments. News 8 was not given any dollar amounts for coronavirus treatment costs, but hypothetically, say someone has pneumonia and the hospital bill is $5,000. If that same person tests positive for COVID-19, the bill is increased by 20%, meaning the hospital in this case gets another grand for their services. The higher the bill, the bigger the additional payout. CMS says Medicare providers are required to accurately bill for services. Metro told us coding guidelines are very clear that this is only to be used for confirmed cases and or presumptive cases not for suspected probably or inconclusive cases meaning at the very least 
the individual has to have tested positive for the virus at the local or state level. Any inaccurate claims or diagnosis can face civil or criminal charges. We ask CMS if they've had any cases of fraud. We're waiting to hear back. Dr. Fauci, I want to ask you specifically about masks. Now, I'm in South Carolina right now, and there's not a whole lot of people wearing masks. So I want to ask you specifically, can you define for people what the role of masks is and why were we told to wait? Why were we told later in the spring to wear them when we initially were told not to? Okay, that's a good question, and I'm glad that you asked and to give me the opportunity to clarify it. So let's start with your first question. You know, n masks are not 100% protected. However, they certainly are better than not wearing a mask, both to prevent you if you happen to be a person who maybe feels well but has an asymptomatic infection that you don't even know about, to prevent you from infecting someone else, but also it can protect to a certain degree, not 100%, in protecting you from getting infected from someone who either is breathing or coughing or sneezing or singing or whatever it is in which the droplets or the aerosols go out. So masks work. The important thing is actually physical separation. So physical separation that we talk about all the time is the best way to get a virus not to get to you. But often it's impossible physically, logistically, to be physically separated to the right extent from everyone. And that's the reason why we combine physical separation with a mask, even though a mask is not 100% but it, dis give, it does give you some protection, so you shouldn't discount that. Now, getting back to your first question, which was what about a month or so or two or three ago when people were saying, you don't really need to wear a mask? Well, the reason for that is that we were concerned, the public health community, and many people were saying this, were concerned that it was at a time when personal protective equipment, including the N95 masks and the surgical masks, were in very short supply. And we wanted to make sure that the people, namely the healthcare workers, who were brave enough to put themselves in a harm way to take care of people who you know were infected with the coronavirus and the danger of them getting infected, we did not want them to be without the equipment that they needed. So there was not enthusiasm about going out and everybody buying a mask or getting a mask. We were afraid that that would deter away from the people who really needed it. Now we have masks. We know that you don't need an N95 if you're a person, ordinary person in the street. We also know that simple cloth coverings that many people have can work as well as a mask in many cases. So right now, unequivocally, the recommendation is when you're out there, particularly if you're in a situation with this active infection, keep the distance physically and wear a mask. So although there appear to be some contradiction of you were saying this then and why you're saying this now, actually the circumstances have changed. That's the reason why.